Hello everyone out there in YouTube land. Welcome back to Diego Knows. I, of course, am Diego. And today we are going to continue to uh, talk about uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. That's right, Breakfast at Tiffany's, that piece of shit chick flick from 1961. You all know the one I'm talking about. Okay, it's the one your grandma liked. Okay, it's the one your grandma kept talking about, how romantic it was. It was about a fucking slut is what it was about, all right? That's how romantic it was. It was about as romantic as fucking uh, getting, getting double teamed, getting fucking double teamed like some fucking Chinese handcuffs. Absolutely. That's what. That's how romantic it was, all right? But apparently you women liked it. A lot of gay guys liked it too. Oh, well, you know, it's basically sex in the city, but what you could get away with with the Hays Code and all that, you know, in 1961, okay? They couldn't do the shit back then that they get away with today, all right? So, but it's, it's all implied. It's all in there. You just got to look for it, all right? And just like Sex and the City is written by a fucking gay guy. Of course it was, because who knows uh, heterosexual uh, relationships from a woman's point of view better than a fucking gay guy. Of course, right? And that's what, exactly what this is. Even, it's even the same neighborhood. It's New York. It's the Upper West Side. It's all about the fashion. It's all about the drinking, the parties, the boning. You know, uh, they're not doing anything with your fucking life. Yeah, that, that's exactly what Sex and the City was. And that's exactly what this is. Okay? Uh, basically, it's, it's, it's the... Um, uh, the prelude, the prequel, you could say, uh, to Sex and the City. It's about a fucking slut. Uh, well, it is. It is about a fucking slut and some fucking rich, uh, super attractive fucking uh, guy comes in there and just, just saves her from her fucking sluttiness. Get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. Anyway, I'm Diego, okay? And uh, I'm going to give you a straight man's point of view because that's the point of view you never got, all right? Now, ladies, okay, when you watch this movie, come on, did you really talk to your boyfriends? Of course you fucking didn't. Did you talk to your husband? Of course you fucking You know why? Because they didn't fucking watch it. That's why. They did not fucking watch it, okay? You talk to your gay friends about it and your girlfriends about it and your aunts and your grandmas. You talk to them about this movie. You don't talk to your fucking boyfriend because he don't give a fuck fucking shit. Let's, let's be honest here. He doesn't want to watch this shit. I didn't want to watch it. Okay. I was like 33 years old before I ever fucking saw this movie. And I heard about it my whole fucking life. I had no desire to see this movie. Okay. But finally, I think of some girls that I was working with just kept telling me to give it a chance. I said, fuck it. I think I rented it. I didn't buy it. I think I rented it from Blockbuster like in 2000, like in 2000, somewhere in the early or mid 2000s. I did, and then I watched it, and I was like, okay, I, I, I get it. it. It's an okay movie. It's not a bad movie. I don't want you to get, get the idea that it's a terrible movie. I've seen a lot worse movies. I've seen a lot worse chick flicks, okay? Uh, but the, the whole premise of this movie is fucking stupid as fuck. The only thing really good about this movie is there's only really two good things in this movie. There's Audrey Hepburn. I think she carried the movie on her fucking shoulders with no support <laughs> from anyone in the cast. I mean, everyone in the, everyone in the, in the cast pretty much sucked. Uh, the ones that had, like, big, big parts, they, they sucked. Uh, they had no personalities, really. Uh, some of the smaller, like the characters, the character actors did okay. But for the most part, she was surrounded by fucking people that didn't know how to fucking act. And unfortunately, that includes Drew Pappard, uh, who played uh, Paul Varjek. Yeah, he just fucking, he was just a fucking a stick figure, you know? He was just a fucking Ken doll walking around with no real personality, no real acting talent. Okay, at least not yet. Uh, his acting talent would come out in the 80s. When he played fucking Hannibal Smith from the A Team, that's where I remember him from. I didn't know he was doing this fucking bullshit uh, chick flick movies. I didn't know that when I was a little kid. I was watching him on the A Team with Mr. T. Yeah, fuck yeah, you know that guy. Yeah, that's a great show. I, I gotta do a review on that, man. The A Team. There's nothing more ro 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 romantic than the A Team. <laughs> Hell yeah. Remember, Mr. T was a B. A. Brackus. I remember uh, what's his name? Uh, Dirk. Dirk Benedict was the face. You know, who was later played by Bradley Cooper in the fucking Liam Neeson movie? But we don't give a shit about that, right? Okay, so anyway, yeah, A-Team. For all you guys watching, watch the A-Team. That, that's some real acting he did in that show. Not in this piece of shit. Okay, uh, but like I said, so the movie's not all that bad. Like I said, there's two things to say. Audrey Hepburn's performance, she was incredible in this movie. She really was. I gotta give her... She carried the movie, man. Without her, there's no fucking movie. It's kind of like Ghostbusters Afterlife. Without McKenna Grace in it, there's no fucking movie. <laughs> okay, it's just not... She is the movie. <laughs> She's the only one worth paying attention to. She's the only one acting really well. She's the only one that gets any any sort of character arc, you know? So, and that, that's what's going on here, too, okay? It's all about Holly Gal Lottie. It's all about Holly Galati, or should I call her Lula May, Lula May Barnes, but we ain't gotten to that yet. All right. Uh, and the other thing was the music, okay? Henry Mancini did a great job uh, with Moon River. Uh, that's the only award they actually got. Uh, they were nominated for five awards, uh, Academy Awards, and they only won one, Best Music for Henry Mancini's Moon River, which is a great song. You know, once again, it's, it's in reference to death on Sex and the City as well. And the only reason I bring up Sex and the City is because I reviewed every fucking episode of Sex and the City. It's on this channel. You don't believe me? Pull up any fucking episode of Sex and the City, any of the movies, or even that new piece of shit uh, and Just Like Crap. Pull that up. I reviewed that too. Okay? I know my fucking Sex and the City. And I'm straight. I'm a straight guy and I know my fucking Sex and the City. Okay? I know it. All right? Uh, so anyway. 
Just like I know this fucking movie too, okay? Uh, but it's not, it's not, for me, it's not good enough that, that it, it should be like this fucking, this cult status movie that everybody loves so much. I don't think it's that great. Like I said, it's Audrey Hepburn and, it, and it's Henry Mancini's music, and that's it. Now, Henry, Henry Mancini, if you do not know, is also, he also did the Pink Panther song, you know? Ba-dum, ba-dum. Yeah, that one. He did that song as well. And that, that movie, all those Pink Panther movies were directed by Blake Edwards, uh, who was Ju Julie Andrews' husband. Yeah, and, she, and he directed this piece of shit too, okay? And a lot of the, the things that he did in this movie were just terrible choices. Uh, it, it's, it's a well put together movie, okay? I mean, it, it's shot pretty well. You know, there's a couple of uh, tricks that they did that I immediately pointed out. Uh, for example, they had uh, every time they show Audrey Hepburn with a close-up of her, uh, there's always a filter. If you look at it, look at every fucking close-up of her. She's filtered, okay? Every time they have a close-up of her face, she's in a filter. They put like a fucking a smoggy filter so you can't really see her face. And then in the background shots, it's regular again, you know? So yeah, they did that shit all the fucking... They did that shit on Moonlighting, too. You ever watch that show Moonlighting from the 80s with uh, Sybil Shepard and Bruce Willis? Yeah, they did that to her. Every time they, they pulled up uh, Sybil Shepard's face, it was always like, there was always a filter on there, you know, to make her look prettier. <laughs> and they did this in this movie, too. <clears throat> now, Audrey Hepburn, I already said this in the last video, I'll say it real quickly. She's a pretty girl, but she's not fucking sexy. She's not sexy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lay. I know you love her to death, okay? But let's face it, man. Those clothes that she's wearing and the jewelry she's wearing, the hats... Oh, that shit all looks like it weighs more than her, okay? Uh, those sunglasses she wears look like they weigh more than she does, okay? She looks like a fucking, I'm sorry, she looks like a concentration camp survivor. She does, and I understand that, you know, in the war, you know, she was starving to death during the war, and she, and she got sick during the war, you know, when she was a kid, and then, uh, you know, so she couldn't resume her ballet career or anything like that, you know, and she never really got her appetite back. I'm sorry, she just looks very unhealthy and not very sexy at all. She got the personality, but she just doesn't have the body. I'm sorry, she got the body of a fucking 13 year old boy. It's just not attractive. It's not attractive. Sorry, man. Sorry, ladies. Sorry, I'm, I'm just calling it out. No one else is gonna call it out. This, this movie was not written for her. It was written for Marilyn Monroe. But you gotta remember, Marilyn Monroe was like 30 years old, or 32 years old uh, when this movie was being made. And she turned it down uh, because her agent or her, her lesbian uh, acting coach lover that she was boning uh, told her it'd be a bad idea to play a prostitute. Yeah, like nobody in Hollywood knew she was a fucking slut already, Marilyn Monroe, okay? Uh, yeah, but I guess that would've been too meta for her to play a fucking slut in a movie, you know? Because she always played like the nice girl, you know, the, the ditzy fucking blonde bombshell shell they didn't know how fucking hot she was and all the guys just, oh, drooling all over her and everything that, that, that's Marilyn Monroe and that's what this was supposed to be too uh, but uh, she was so fucking she was so fucking high on drugs and didn't know what the fuck she was doing you know at that time you know she was so fucking uh, you know, self-medicating and drunk and all sorts of fucking pills. She wasn't reliable. Uh, nobody wanted to hire her anymore because she kept fucking, they lost millions of dollars on a movie she was doing with, with uh, Dean Martin, you know? And, uh, and so she was, so Hollywood was kind of like turning their back on her because they knew that she was a basket case. Okay, they knew it. Okay, so she wouldn't have gotten this movie even if she had wanted to do it. Uh, the directors would have said, no, nah, no, nah, she's not, Marilyn's not in a good place. She would have hung up this movie. And, and Marilyn did die a year after this movie came out, okay? So she was in no position uh, uh, psychologically to, to, to keep acting. Unfortunately, she passed away, and we all know how she died, okay? So she was in no, no place, uh, not, not in a healthy place. That'd be like hiring Lindsay Lohan or something, you know? She ain't gonna fucking make it. She ain't gonna make it through the shoot, all right? So anyway, so that's going on here. Okay, so now, uh, real quickly, I just want to tell you some of the differences, and then we'll go into the movie, uh, between the book. I have been reading the story. I'm almost done with it. It was written by Truman Capote in 1958. Okay, Holly Galati in the story, in the book, is 19, 18, 19 years old. And uh, the guy, that, that the main character, the male character, is not named at all in the book, but we do know through subtle references that he is gay. Okay, he doesn't have a name. We know he's a writer, but he is gay. And for some fucking reason, he is the appropriate age to have been drafted into World War II because the story takes place in 1943, okay? But he, for some reason, he does not fucking, uh, he is not forced to go fight World War II for whatever reason it is. He's not given a reason why, okay? But he does not go fight World War II. He does say in the book, though, that he's scared that he will get drafted, uh, but uh, apparently he's, he is of the appropriate age to go to war, but for some reason, he doesn't want to be a soldier. He doesn't want to go fight with the, other, with the straight guys and go risk his life. He'd rather fucking stay uh, in New York you know, around the department stores and hanging out with the fucking, uh, the, the, the gay girls. You know, that, that's, his, that's his courage right there. It's fucking uh, uh, hanging out with Holly Galati, okay? 
So he befriends her. He actually kind of likes her. Like they talk about that in the book, but it's not, it's never like in a romantic way. Okay. And she flirts with him too, but she also says that she's a lesbian and she also says, well, she's only half lesbian. That's what she says. You know, she lived with a girl once. She's fucking had some carpet in her lunchbox in the past. Okay. She has, she admits to that as much. Okay. Uh, but she also says she uses men for money. And if they want to get like, you know, if they want to get like, you know, uh, if they want, you know, to, uh, to prove her head of her sexuality, then she fucking pretends to be a lesbian. Uh, but not all the time. Uh, if she ends up liking the guy, uh, she will fuck him, okay? And, and the and same thing in this movie. If she likes the guy, she'll fuck him, okay? <laughs> she doesn't she just use guys for their money, okay? The guys that she's not attracted to, she just takes her money. But the guys that she is attracted to, she fucks them and takes her money. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How women have progressed since then, right? This, this movie is like, what, fucking 60 years old, man? It's, it's a long time ago. All right. Uh, so that's one of the biggest changes. The guy was gay in the book. He's not gay in this movie. Obviously, this is a romance movie, so he can't be gay. <laughs> uh, the Hayes Code was in effect, so you couldn't have gay characters. Uh, you could allude to gay characters. They were doing that back then. Uh, but you couldn't come straight out and say, I'm homosexual. You couldn't do that in the fucking in the movie. The Hayes Code would not have allowed it. It wasn't until the invention of the rated R movie, like in the early 70s, that they actually started uh, doing that. Okay? I mean, even on TV, man, I was watching an episode of Kojak the other day. Kojak, yeah, that came out in 1973. And in there, you couldn't say, uh, you couldn't use, a, uh, you couldn't say gay. Uh, or you couldn't say homosexual either. You had to say, uh, Kojak says, like, oh, my God, another friggin' $3 bill. <laughs> like, you know. He's a fruit. <laughs> they had to say things like that, okay? But you knew you knew what they meant, right? <laughs> so anyway. Hey, man, I was a kid in the 70s. I didn't know what gay people were. I did not know until I was much older. All right. So anyway. <clears throat> So that's the big thing. He had no name. Like I said, in the book, he had no name. Uh, and the movie is called Paul Barjack, okay? Uh, obviously, since this guy was a gay guy in the book and he was a writer, that was his job. He had no other job. He was a writer. <laughs> well, in this movie, uh, he does have another job, okay? He lays the pipe, okay? He solves female plumbing problems, if you know what I mean. <laughs> hey, man. It's good work if you can get it, man. If you can get it, it's good work. He's young. He's good looking. What the hell, man? You know? He's slinging, slinging schlong. <laughs> He's peddling pud. <laughs> and not for gay guys either. I'm, I'm pretty sure he did that too. <laughs> for sugar mamas, he gets paid and gets laid. <laughs> <clears throat> Damn. <clears throat> yeah, how do you like that guy from the A-Team? Yeah, he's fucking... Yeah, man. Some guys have all the luck. Anyway, uh, so yes, okay, so he's a gigolo <laughs> in the fucking movie. He's a gigolo in the movie, okay, no. He's a writer that doesn't fucking, he doesn't even have any fucking uh, ribbon. He has no ink ribbon in his fucking typewriter, okay? <laughs> Just fucking right. He's got a sugar mama, okay? He's a decorator, okay, who basically pays all his bills as long as he keeps stuffing her, you know? And which I get, yeah, it's great work if you can do it, man. If you can do it, absolutely. <laughs> You know, uh, so yeah, so he's a gigolo, okay? Um, and his client, his decorator, uh, she has a name, but they don't really say it. Uh, he calls her 2E. Two 2E, two e, because that's the, that's, the, that's the apartment he lives in, okay, that she got from. She got him an apartment in this brownstone uh, right above from uh, Holly Galati's apartment, okay? <laughs> so, so he's apartment 2E, okay, I guess. So he calls her 2E because she paid for his fucking apartment. She, I mean, she furbished it and everything she paid for all the furniture and the even the clothes that he's wearing okay she paid for all that shit so obviously she's a rich woman her husband's super rich so when her husband's in town she can't really fuck him but when you know whenever her husband's out of town or when he's not suspecting she can just go to his apartment because she paid for it she's got a key and just fucking you know just have have him plow the field which must be a good job man damn some guys get all the look anyway like i said but in the book he was gay and holly was bi all right okay um yeah, now in the book, uh, she also leaves the cat, okay? She does not go back and run for the cat, okay? The drawers. Uh, one, of the, one of the themes uh, of the book, when Truman Capote wrote it, is the theme of the book was uh, that forever, you know, you, 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 um, you're not knowing what's yours until you've thrown it away, okay? Uh, not knowing what's yours until you've thrown it away. That's a quote from the book, okay? That's basically where he tells Holly uh, that, you know, you don't know what you've got until you lost it. Okay, basically, that's the theme of the book, okay? And unfortunately, in the book, it is not a happy ending like it is here, but we'll get to that later when we get to that part in, uh, in, the, in the movie. All right. Okay, yeah, but in the book, she is, she uh, ends up, she's just alone, 
and doesn't know what she's looking for. So it's kind of a sad ending in the story. Uh, but the reason people like the story isn't because of the ending, okay? It's because of the way it was written, the witty dialogue that Truman Capote used. He was a very famous uh, guy. He was in, always invited to all the socialite parties in New York. He went to all the parties in New York, okay? If you had anything to do with the publishing industry or even or Broadway, the acting industry in New York, because that's where all Broadway is, you know, uh, then he, he was at your party. Any sort of celebrity, they wanted Truman Capote there because he was always the life of the party. He was the wittiest guy. He could fucking keep a conversation going for hours and people just like to be around him. He was so witty and charming, okay? Even though he's a short little pudgy fucking guy with big glasses, you know, gay guy with big glasses, but hey, <clears throat> he's Truman Capote, okay? Now, another thing in here, uh, Blake Edwards, like I said earlier, directed this movie. Uh, he was actually, used, when he was first starting out his career in Hollywood, he was actually roommates with Mickey Rooney. With Mickey Rooney, who was also in this movie, so they were they were pretty good friends. Uh, Mickey Rooney's career wasn't really doing that great right now. I mean, you got to remember, Mickey Rooney was a child actor. He started off as a child actor, uh, started in, uh, in in the silent movies as a little kid, and as he got in, into his teens, he started doing these Andy Hardy movies, okay, for MGM. Uh, now there was no TV back in the 30s, okay. So basically, if you were to watch a TV show right now about some like nerdy little fucking kid, uh, teenager, you know, 13, 14 years old, who's always falling in love with some hot girl from school and he hangs out with his friends and they tease him and he tries to win over the girl and makes a fool of himself you know because he's not that good looking but he's charming and eventually at the end he's good natured and then at the end he gets the girl okay well that sounds like your typical fucking tv show from the fucking 50s something like maybe uh, the many loves of Dobie gillis or some shit like that but there was no tv in the 30s so it was a series of movies called the Andy Hardy movies. And in the 1930s, uh, those were the most popular movies in the cinema. Okay, the Andy Hardy movies. Look it up on, on uh, Wikipedia. The Andy Hardy movies. All of them starred Mickey Rooney as Andy Hardy. So basically, Mickey Rooney was the fucking... Um, uh, the, what's his name? The fucking... Whatever fucking uh, pop star you've got. Fucking the Justin Timberlake, okay, of the 1930s, okay? He was that guy, okay? Um... Uh, so yeah, yeah, he, he was he was that guy. He was the fucking David Cassidy of the fucking 1930s. Okay, he was the he was that guy, right? So these these movies were very popular amongst teenagers. The Andy Hart. So they made a whole shitload of them. It was a whole fucking franchise. Uh, I think even his friend um, uh, Judy Garland, yeah, uh, Judy Garland, I think was in one of them. Uh, whatever, but. Um, yeah, so they used, to, they used to team them up together all the time. Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland were always getting teamed up together. Because Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland were both uh, four foot eleven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mickey Rooney's a short motherfucker. Okay, so uh, yeah, so he was very popular in the 1930s, okay? Uh, but then, of course, you know, World War II hit, and he had to go fucking fight. Uh, he was married to the most beautiful woman in Hollywood at that time, Ava Gardner, but she divorced. She started cheating on him immediately because he wanted to hang out with his buddies and fuck, uh, fuck starlets, you know? And, and he liked to gamble a lot, and he liked to play pool a lot, you know, and play golf a lot. Okay, so uh, yeah, so he kind of fucking squandered his fortune. When he came back, he was too old to do the Andy Hardy movies, already in his 20s now, and he wasn't getting those acting roles anymore. So he was trying and stuff. At, at this time, 1961, he was doing television, which is something he swore he would never do. Now, he'd been married like four or five times. In fact, uh, one, of the, um, one of the wives that he had, if you look at, I can't remember which one, one of the wives that he had, when I think when he was in his 40s or something, uh, she had an affair. She was cheating on him. Okay, and uh, Mickey found out about it. He was now he'd been cheated on before by all of his wives, so he already knew what to do. He already knew how to kick her out and make sure she got nothing uh, in the divorce. Uh, so she got scared, so she tried to reconcile her marriage with Mickey Rooney so that they wouldn't get divorced. So in order for her to do that, she had to stop uh, screwing this other guy. Okay, so she broke it off with the other guy uh, to get back with her husband. The other guy did not take it well, and he went over to her fucking house and fucking blew her away. Yeah, and killed her, and then he killed himself. Yeah, look it up. All right. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, Mickey Rooney has not been very happy in love. Okay, because you got to remember, he was the fucking um, uh, he, he was he was a fucking teen idol uh, in the '30s. So he didn't have to. He had he wasn't hurting to get women. Okay, women were throwing themselves at him. Okay, uh, Lana Turner threw himself at him. Like I said, he married Ava Gardner for Christ's sake. That that's the girl that fucking Frank Sinatra almost killed himself over. Okay, so you know, and she fucked the Kennedys too. So he was a high value man when he was a kid, but when he was an adult, a middle age, not so much anymore. He didn't look like a cute little kid anymore. So it was hard for him to get work. So I remember around this time he was doing like he was popping up on TV shows and stuff, you know. And he's always been like very bad tempered and alcoholic. Okay, and uh, I know he was in an episode of The Twilight Zone at around this time. Okay, but he was doing TV now, and he was he couldn't be a leading man anymore because he was too short. 
He was too pudgy. He had, to, he had a funny looking, you know, his baby fat always stayed on his face throughout his entire life. Okay, so he was a bit shadow of what he used to be. So he was desperate for work at this time. Like I said, he, used, he was friends with Blake Edwards, but Blake Edwards found a role for him in this movie, uh, which is obviously uh, one of the most racist fucking portrayals uh, I've ever seen in a fucking movie. And I've seen some blackface and stuff, you know, from like the 1920s and the 30s. Uh, I watched Amos and Andy, you know, and I listened to Amos and Andy. It was two white guys pretending to be black. It was very, ra very uh, fucking racist, uh, the shit they used to get away with back in the day. Okay, and this was just another example of that. Okay, uh, he plays this guy named Mr. Yonoshi, who lives on the top floor. Okay, he's this bungle bumbling photographer, you know, uh, Asian guy with these big fucking teeth. They're obviously fake. They, they trimmed his eyebrows to make him look Asian. He's basically an Asian fucking stereotype, and it's fucking absolutely fucking horrendous. And why Blake Edwards? decided to go this way. I know he was trying to give his friend a job because he needed the work, okay, but this wasn't the way to fucking do it. Uh, the reason Blake Edwards, uh, this this guy did not act like this in the, in the book. He was mentioned in the book, but he didn't act like this way at all. It was actually a woman that lived in the building that fucking hated Holly Galati and was trying to get her evicted. It wasn't Mr. Yanoshi in the book, okay? And um, so, yeah, so that's going on. And it's just a terrible racist portrayal of Asians, and I can't believe that they they put it in there, but it's in there. Uh, so right now, this is it's one of the, it's a big minus for me in Blake Edwards' part that he would do this. Uh, you know, even back then they knew this was wrong to portray pe fucking people this way. You know, and and it, it, it disgusts me the way he portrayed it. I don't blame Mickey Rooney so much because like he's just doing a job. He got paid for this. He needed the money. Okay, I blame uh, Blake Edwards uh, for putting this character like that and for putting Mickey Rooney to play this fucking obviously racial racist stereotype of fucking Asian. Uh, American in there. It's just fucking terrible. Absolutely terrible. The accent, everything fucking blows on this. And uh, I remember seeing a movie called Dragon, the Bruce Lee story in 1993. It was a movie about Bruce Lee. And there was a part in that movie where Bruce Lee and his wife, uh, Linda, before they were married, they went on a date and they went to the movie theater to go see this, Breakfast at Tiffany's. And everyone was laughing uh, during the Mickey Rooney scenes. Okay? And if you look at Bruce Lee's face, uh, Jason Scott Lee played Bruce Lee in the movie. Uh, if you look at his face, he was the only person in the whole fucking, uh, in the packed audience that was not laughing. He was not laughing at this portrayal of Asians, okay? That's one of the biggest problems Bruce Lee had in America was the way, uh, the way that people treated Asians. It wasn't just the blacks, okay? I mean, I'm Mexican myself, okay? And we weren't treated that great either, okay? Uh, so, you know, it's not just the black people that are treated like shit back in the day, okay? It was all people from all sorts of walks of life, okay? Uh, us us, uh, 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 us uh, Mexican-Americans like me, we got kicked out of the country too, even though we were born here. You know, uh, during World War II, you know, uh, Asians were put in fucking concentration camps here in America, here in a fucking America, thanks to FDR. Yeah, Mr. Fucking uh, Liberal Democrat F FDR uh, did that to Asian Americans. Okay, uh, yeah, and they don't talk, no one makes movies about that. No one talks about that. You know, uh, but it's true. It's there. It's all, it's all real, you know, and this is just another example of some of the races. So thank God we have moved past this. Something like this uh, would never, ever happen today. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not today. This was 1961. Okay. So there's that. All right. Okay. Now, before her death, uh, you know, okay. It's the most woman. Okay. Now, another thing real quickly about Audrey Hepburn. Now, the reason this, this movie connects so well with ladies is because Audrey is a very relatable, okay? And she's very unpretentious, okay? Like, what she what you see is what you get with her, okay? Uh, but she can act out, the, she acts out the fantasies that women have. Women that are average looking like Audrey Hepburn. I'm sorry, I know you all love her, Deb, but she's average looking, okay? Uh, they fantasize about having a lifestyle like her, okay? Where other people pay her bills and she just can go shopping. And look at the, I mean, I know she's hard up for money, okay? But look at the clothes that she has. And I'm, I'm no fan fashion expert. I'm not. Okay. Cause I'm not fucking gay. All right. But I can tell by some of the costumes that she's wearing in this movie that this shit looks like it costs money. I mean, the opening scene, she's got what fucking seven or eight pearls necklaces on and they've got glowing bling blings on there. Are, are those diamonds? I don't fucking know. She's got a fucking shit in her head. That's, that's flashy too. Is, is are those rubies on her? And I don't know. I don't know. You know, but she looked, the shit she's wearing looks expensive as fuck. All right. Like I said, it's the original sex in the city. Okay. So now let's get into the movie. The movie opens up with her. She's getting out of a cab, and she it's, it's obviously early in the morning. We're in Manhattan, Upper West Side, and she goes in front of a Tiffany's window. Now, now there's no no one. In the, there's no traffic. There's no people around. So I'm guessing it's very early in the morning. Okay, we find out later on uh, that it is actually Thursday morning. 
Okay, so it's probably like almost like 5 a.m. on a Thursday morning before the before everyone starts walking around going to work. Uh, she's got a, uh, a croissant in one hand. She pulls it out of the bag. And she's got a coffee cup in the other. She eats her croissant and she just sips her coffee while she's staring into the display window of a Tiffany's department store. Okay, yeah, Tiffany's. Okay, and she's looking at some chandeliers or some shit. Ooh, the fuck? That's what it looks like to me. Okay, and you see the credits there. You know, breakfast at Tiffany's. Okay, everyone. It's a very iconic scene. Everyone remembers this. Okay, because of the fucking necklaces and because she's got the white scarf around her. You know, around her arm you know the black dress that goes down to her ankles you know uh the bling bling around you know she, she just has a very the big sun, black sunglasses that she's wearing and uh in real life she actually hated croissants so yes she had trouble doing the scene because she absolutely hated uh croissants she did not want to eat them but she had to do it for the scene at least she doesn't let her she throws her garbage in the trash can and then she walks home she walks to her brownstone and there's a guy sitting in his car that's in a tuxedo that's been waiting for her Okay, he fell asleep in the car, but he's sitting there across the street from her apartment. She notices him. She recognizes him. She starts running towards uh, her front door. Okay, he wakes up. He sees her. He starts chasing after her. We don't know who this guy is, but he starts chasing after her. She sees him, and she tries to get in there and close the door in his face, but he, he manages to make it in there, okay? Okay, you know, um, so that's going on. We find out his name is Sid Ar Arbuck. Okay, and he was at a party with her earlier that night. Okay, uh, apparently he tells her, hey, don't you remember you? You like me. Of course you like me. You told me you like me. I know you like me. Remember me, Sid Arbuck? We were dead. You, you said you were going to the bathroom, and I gave you $50, and I didn't see you again. You know, I paid for, I paid for all those food, all those drinks for your friends. Doesn't that, doesn't that, don't I get any rights because of that? You know, basically. So this is a guy that she used him for his money. And after she was done with him, after he paid the tab uh, for whatever dinner and drinks that her and her friends had, uh, she asked to go to the bathroom. He gave her 50 bucks. That, that's, that's code uh, for something. Okay, uh, like I said, it was the Hayes Code back then, so you couldn't say what it really was. Okay, I never once thought she got 50 bucks uh, for going to the bathroom, all right? I know bathroom attendants charge, for, even today, no bathroom attendants charge 50 fucking dollars for anything in there, okay? No fucking Bob Bigelow's, all right? So, uh, yeah, so she got the 50 bucks, and she fucking hightailed it out of there because she didn't want to see him anymore. He followed her home, and he's been waiting for her all, all fucking night, waiting for her to come back home so he can fucking, I guess, you know... Uh, you know, uh, get a return on his investment, apparently, but she ain't gonna give it to him. He's an older man, middle-aged, he's unattractive, you know, he, he talks like he's a fucking, like, a low-life creep. She calls them rats in the movie, he's obviously a rat. He thought because he spent all his fucking money on her that she was gonna give him some sexual favors, and she's not, so he's pissed off, okay? Uh, so that's why he fucking followed her home. You know, whatever. And this is this is the way that Holly manipulates men. She's very good at this. She's very good at talking to men and telling them what they want to hear, making them feel like studs, uh, only to fucking suck them dry. Okay, she's a sycophant. A uh, sycophant. That's what she is. All right. <clears throat> so anyway, she can't get in the apartment because she lost her key again. It's been two weeks since she lost her key, so she has to buzz. And she buzzes Mr. Yonoshi, or Mickey Rooney, who I already told you about. He wakes up. He's pissed off that he gets, he has that she wakes him up. And of course, he bumbles and shit, hits his head against his own fucking lamp. And, and, and purpose, it looks like he purposely crashes into shit, like his ironing board and stuff and his table. He's just knocking shit over left and right because he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Like I said, terrible portrayal of Asians, uh, you know. And then he goes, I protest! You know, you lose or you must get new key. You cannot wake me up. I artist, I need my sleep. I need my rest. You know, that kind of with those big fucking fake teeth of his. It's just disgusting. He's screaming at her from the top floor, you know. Um, and meanwhile, fucking uh, Ar Sid Arbuck is screaming at her about because he wants to come in and fuck. You know, and she, she re rejected him and trying to calm down Mr. You know, she, she kicks him out of there. She gets Sid out of there. Okay, and she tells uh, Mr. You know, she, hey, you know. If you, uh, if you know, quit bitching at me about this, I might uh, pose for those pictures we talked. So basically, she's offering him sex, too, if he just shuts the fuck up. She'll pose nude for him. And that, of course, turns Mr. Yanushio, oh, okay, yeah, you know, like that, you know, just disgusting. Anyway, so that, that calms him down. Then she goes into her fucking apartment, all right? You know, uh, the next scene we have is Paul. We finally meet Paul, played by George Papard. He plays a guy named Paul Varjak, who I said is a fucking male gigolo, okay? He's schlinging schlong, as I said. <laughs> So he gets out of a taxi cab, but apparently he just got back from Rome. His key does not work, so he needs to be buzzed in. So he buzzes the buzzer, and that wakes up uh, Holly Galati, who's asleep with her fucking, uh, 
her blinders, like, you know, the, the fucking things that women wear when they go to sleep. I don't fucking, I never wear that shit. But she's there with her cat, and she hears the buzzing, so she, she goes, she wakes up. Uh, she goes up there, she buzzes him in. He starts carrying his luggage up the stairs, you know, and he tells her, hey, he tries to introduce himself, but she's wearing earplugs, so she can't fucking hear him, so she takes him off. He tells her, hey, listen, I'm sorry, I lost my key. My key I guess, is only good for the upstairs, not the downstairs. That's why I had to wake you up. I'm sorry about that. Can I come in and use your phone? You know, just this kind of thing a rapist would say. Uh, and she, of course, she lets him in because she's very uninhibited. She doesn't give a shit this guy's a stranger. She's used to strangers just coming into her place, if you know what I mean. I guess so she's not threatened at all, or, or she's not worried for her at all he walks right in there and he tells her oh my god it looks like you just move you're just moving in too she's like oh no i've been here for over a year you know because her, her place is a fucking shithole there's no furniture there's a little fucking uh, a little couch thing on the floor but that's it uh she has no 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 dishes no no art no nothing there's nothing on the shelves okay there's just a fucking cat there Okay, now he walks in there and uh, she keeps her fucking phone in a fucking suitcase on the corner of the floor. Okay, <laughs> and she just fucking starts talking and talking. She does not fucking shut up. She just keeps fucking talking. Now, that's one of the things I said where, you know, she carries the movie because Audrey Hepburn does carry this movie. Okay, because uh, Holly Galati does not shut the fuck up. She's always fucking talking. Okay, um, uh, fucking Paul Vardy doesn't really have to say much. He just says enough uh, to get the conversation started. And then once she gets the conversation started, she just goes off. All right. So she's basically just standing there like a dope, you know, mm, oh my god, pretty girl. Oh, she's like, like he's fascinated, like he's looking at a fucking animal in the zoo. That's how he looks at her, and she's completely oblivious because she's so fucking caught up in her own fucking uh, train of thought, or her, her, her ditzy train of thought about fucking Tiffany's and, 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 the, and, the, and the mean reds and, and the difference between a depression and sadness, and it just, she just goes off on this shit. And then she points out the cat jumps on him, so he just shocks him. She goes, oh, that cat doesn't have a name, so her cat does not have a name because she does not own anything. Okay, uh, we do not belong to each other. Okay, uh, you know, we don't, we don't belong to each other. She says that. We don't belong to each other. It's just a cat. Okay, and uh, she feeds the cat milk and she drinks milk out of a fucking champagne glass. So she's just ditzy and walking around her apartment, you know, barefoot, you know, just like a shirt on and that's it. You know, sipping milk from a fucking champagne glass and explaining to this guy all this fucking information that he did not ask her about. All right, <laughs> she admits that she's crazy about Tiffany's. Okay, she talks about that. She says whenever she gets the mean reds, okay, which is different from depression. That's just sad. The mean reds is when you automatically just feel feel fear for no reason at all. She can't explain it. The only thing that makes her feel good is going to Tiffany. So she opts in a cab. She goes to Tiffany where everything's great. Nothing bad can happen to me there. You know, so Tiffany's not, not a place. It's a fucking state of mind, okay? You know, uh, she says she won't settle down ever until she finds a place that makes her feel the way Tiffany's does. Okay, uh, make, uh, make a place that makes her feel that way. Okay, and she keeps her phone, like I said, in a fucking a suitcase on the floor. That way, it's muffled. She doesn't have to hear a fucking ring. Then why have a fucking phone? Okay, uh, and he tells her, uh, uh, he said, "I'm sorry, I got I got to call someone. Whatever, I was supposed to meet somebody." Uh, and, and she asks, "What time is it?" He says, "Oh, it's 10 a.m. on Thursday." And she fucking flips. Oh my god! And she jumps up off the couch and starts fucking brushing her teeth right away. And of course, does she shut up when she brushes her teeth? No, she keeps fucking talking to him, even though he's trying to make a fucking phone call uh, she keeps talking to him while he's brushing his teeth okay yeah and she does and brushing her teeth and she's starting to get ready she never shuts up the whole fucking time okay okay so she's wandering around the house okay and and now this is the part here where she starts manipulate we start to see how she manipulates men and she starts off with Paul this way the first thing she does okay she tells him be a deer and and look under my bed there, there should be some alligator shoes in there Okay, and he's like, oh, okay, okay. And now that's a congruence test, okay? Basically, the reason she said that is she wants to see if he's gonna do it, okay? Is he gay, which he was in the book, he wouldn't have done it, but, or is he straight? If he's straight, does he like me? Is he attracted to me, okay? Can I use him? Okay, let's find out, okay? First of all, I'm gonna ask him to do something simple, something low risk, like, uh, can you, hey, uh, look for my shoes for me, okay? Now, if a guy immediately jumps up, either he has a sense of chivalry or he likes this girl and like he wants to do what she says because he's hoping he can get something out of her. Those are the kind of men that she's used to dealing with. Okay, another thing that she's doing by asking him to go under her bed, she's basically telling him, hey, I'm inviting you into my private space. You can come into my private space. Okay, see what she's doing there? Okay, she's basically, she's communicating all these different things. She's testing him out to see if he'll do it. Testing him out to see if she, he likes her or not. If he, is he straight? That kind of thing, you know. And now she's also testing to see if, she'll, if he'll do what she says. Okay, because if he does, then she knows that she can manipulate him. If he doesn't, then she can't. 
okay? And also she's hinting that, hey, you know, you can see my private parts, okay? By, you, can, you can look under my bed. It's okay. You know, see that kind of thing? Like it's okay to go into my private stuff, all right? So that basically that's how it starts off. She's testing him out and she will continue. It doesn't, it doesn't end here. She continues to test him out throughout the movie, okay? Especially in the beginning, okay? But that's, that's the beginning. I saw that right away. First time I saw this movie, I knew exactly what she was doing, okay? Because this is, this is how guys flirt. You know, they test. They test to see if a girl likes them or not. They do. They say little fucking things. You know, make a little joke about her. You know, they call it a neg in the pickup community. And if she, uh, if she like is flattered by it or something, then you're know, okay. So she wants my approval. If she's disgusted by it, whatever, she's okay. So this girl doesn't really like me. She's trying to use me now. Now I can get rid of her. You see what I mean? And she's doing the same thing. Okay. But it, it is kind of cool to see how she does that, okay? How does Holly Galati, a girl who's average looking at me, she's pretty, okay, but there's lots of pretty girls in New York. There's lots of girls that are better looking than her. How is that she's a professional gold digger? Well, this is how. This is what she gets. I said this when I reviewed Sex in the City. How is it that Mr. Big fell in love with Carrie Bradshaw? What's so special about her? Yeah, she's a pretty girl for a middle-aged girl, but he can get younger and hotter. He has gotten younger and hotter. So why settle for fucking Carrie as opposed to all the other girls that he dated, okay? And the reason is because he likes being around because of her personality. Okay, that's what she brings that no other girl brings. And it's the same thing with Holly Galati, her personality. Okay, she knows how to fucking flirt. Okay, she doesn't just stand there and, and, you know, and, and guys come up to her. She knows how to tell guys what they want to hear to make them feel special. And by them feeling special, they want to make her feel special. They want to they make her happy. Okay, that's how you do it, ladies. That's how you do it. Watch Holly Galati. She knows what she's fucking doing. Okay, I'm going to stop my review right here, but I'll be back shortly and I will continue my review of uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, that fucking chick flick. I thank you for watching this long and I'll see you soon on the next one. Bye.